uh, share this morning a little bit on singing in the Spirit. Singing in the Spirit. So last week we spoke about praying in the Spirit. And today I want to talk about singing in the Spirit. And uh, But in my introduction, I'll just talk a little bit about what I was sharing last Sunday to finish off that prayer part. But it's so important. This is so important to our faith life. Learning how to sing in the Spirit. Amen. So let's read uh, First Corinthians. Uh, sorry, Second Corinthians. Uh, sorry, First Corinthians. First, um, First Corinthians, chapter fourteen. It's a problem with these. If you write the wrong, type in the wrong number. First Corinthians, chapter fourteen, verse fourteen and fifteen. There we go. <laughs> All right. You got it. You there? Okay. It says, "For if I pray in an unknown tongue." My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What does that mean? It just means I, my mind doesn't understand what I'm praying because I'm praying in tongues. And then he says in verse 15, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding. Now, last Sunday we spoke about that. I will pray with the Spirit means I will pray in tongues and then I will pray with my understanding, but led by the Spirit. Amen. Two different things. I will pray in tongues, which is the prayer language that we receive when we are baptised with the Holy Spirit. But then we can pray in our own language, but led by the Spirit, not by our mind, not by our flesh, not by our senses. Because if we pray by our senses, we're going to pray what we see, what we hear, what's going on around us. And most times that's a fleshy prayer. It's a fleshy prayer. Amen. Amen. And uh, so let's keep reading. It says, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. Isn't that interesting? So I will pray in the Spirit. I will pray in tongues. I will pray with the understanding led by the Spirit and I will sing in tongues. I will sing in the Spirit and I will sing with my understanding led by the Spirit. Amen. So I want to talk about this this morning and maybe continue next Sunday because this is, this is so important for us. Very important that we understand these elements to a powerful and effective faith life. Amen. These are, these are I'm going to be very honest with you, these are verses that not many ter- churches would touch today. I don't know the last time I heard a message, unless I've looked for it, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, singing in tongues. I don't know if I've heard a message on singing in in the Spirit and also teaching us what it is to sing in the Spirit with our own language. What it is to pray in the Spirit with our own language but led by the Spirit. And this is why so much of prayer life today in church is very poor. It's very limited. It's very shallow because it is praying in the flesh. If you listen to yourself, you you find yourself praying the same thing over and over again. Repetitive prayers. And now we talk about the religious church, the Catholic church, the traditional church. Most religions in the world, their prayers are repetitive. It's just repetitive prayers. They are flesh. They are traditional prayers. Religious prayers that have been passed down. Recite this. Read this prayer. It's a flesh prayer. We want to pray in the Spirit. When we, when we are born again, when we are born again, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. He's, and the Holy Spirit resides in us, in our spirit, in, inside the real you is not your flesh and blood. It is a spirit being on the inside of you. That's the real you. will live forever. And when we are born again, our spirit comes alive inside of us. We are born again. The first time you were born was in the flesh. You were born through the womb of your mum. That's the first birth. But then when you receive Jesus, you are born again. But what is born again? Do you remember Nicodemus asked Jesus, what, can I go back into my mother's womb? Being an old man? No, you shall be born of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Spirit and water. And so our spirit comes alive and we're born again and God gives us the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And then there's, there's the, the, the uh, second experience 
that God gives to us once we're saved, which is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That's separate to salvation. But that's the empowering. That's the baptism with the Holy Spirit that God gives to us. And when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, we can, God gives us the blessing to speak and to pray with other tongues. Amen? And so we, we, must, we must understand that the Holy Spirit resides in us, whether we're baptized with the Holy Spirit or not. He's in us. And so if we have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, which I pray we all have, you can still pray and sing in the Spirit because you, got to, you, you are led by the inward Spirit of God that is in you. And you, but that's something you've got to learn. That's something you have to cultivate. That's something we've got to train ourselves to do. Amen? And so uh, these, are, these things are very essential to our Christian life. Very essential and they are very important to God. They're not, they're not essential to the church <laughs> world much anymore. They become non-essentials. Uh, things like praying in the Spirit, preaching in the Spirit. Do you know that there's preaching in the Spirit? Yes. And there's preaching in the flesh. Yes. That we need preaching in the Spirit. Then there's walking in the Spirit. Yes. You remember Galatians chapter 6 talks about if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There is walking in the Spirit as well. And then there is what I want to look at today a little bit, singing and worshipping in the Spirit. Amen? And so uh, for, for, for us to have maximum results for our, for our prayer, our preaching, our living, and our worship to have maximum result, it must be done in the Spirit. It must be done in the Spirit. It must be led by the Spirit. There must be spirit life in it. Otherwise, it becomes hard. It becomes a burden. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to preach. We don't know how to live a Christian life successfully because we're doing it in the flesh. We're doing it in our own strength. Uh, we don't know how to sing. That's why people come late sometimes to church because they don't, they don't, that worship part, they don't know what to do. They just... They just, you know, what do I do? How can I? They find it hard because they're doing it in their flesh. Yeah. Amen. And so that's why people find it hard to come to prayer meetings because what do I pray? How do I pray? Well, pray in the Spirit. Amen. And it changes everything. Amen? Amen. So we're going to look at that very soon. But just let me finish off what I shared last Sunday morning. Praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, and praying in, the, in your own language led by the Spirit. Let go, let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and verse 27. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and verse 27. And you could, we could add, you know, we, 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 you can have church services in the Spirit, you can have church services in the flesh. We want to have spirit life in our church service. Amen? Romans chapter 8, verse 26, verse 27. Look what it says. Powerful verse. You need to underline this verse. You need to memorize this verse. Look what it says. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for. Everybody say what. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought to pray. So that word ought is how. So we don't know what to pray and we don't know how to pray. But look what it says. The Spirit helps in our weakness. Just before we continue reading, it's a very weak position to be in when we don't know what to pray and we don't know how to pray, what to pray. <laughs> it, that's a very weak position to find yourself in. I don't know what to pray and I don't know how to pray, what to pray for. But the Spirit helps in our weakness. Let's keep reading. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Can you say amen to that powerful verse there? And then the next verse is verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That verse Many Christians take that verse out of context. 
they haven't prayed in the Spirit, they haven't prayed in, led by the Spirit, and then they say, oh, this is going to work out for my good because all things work together for good. No, no, all things that the Holy Spirit is involved with will work together for good to those that love God. Amen? Amen? So isn't, isn't it an amazing thing to have the Holy Spirit help us pray? The Holy Spirit wants to help us pray. How many times do you find yourself not knowing what to pray and not knowing how to pray, the mechanism, what words to use? And the Holy Spirit, He's there. There's no, for me, it's ridiculous praying led by my mind. It's crazy. That's, that's it's second rate. It's, it's uh, actually uh, Derek Prince, who was a teacher of the Word, said many years ago, he said, there's no prayer that God will hear unless it's in the Spirit. That's a powerful, it's a pretty strong statement. God will not hear prayers that are not in the Spirit, led by the Spirit. They are ineffective. Actually, if, if we go quickly to James, just go to James chapter 4, I think it is. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and let's read from verse 1 onwards. Look what it says. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Look at verse 3. And then he says, and when you ask and you do not receive, why? Because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your lusts, pleasures. So look, there is a prayer. They're praying. They're asking. I'm praying to God. I'm asking God. And he says here, you ask and you do not receive. How many people pray and they do not receive? Why? Why? Because you ask amiss. What does that mean? The, the prayer does not hit the target. You miss the target. It's ineffective. It's not powerful. It doesn't get the job done. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. And what, and what kind of a prayer is it? It is a prayer that you may spend it on your pleasures. So it is a prayer, give me. Give me, help me, do for me, open doors for me. And it's all so that I can satisfy my fleshy desires. And so a large portion of the church asks and never receives because they ask amiss, which is praying in the flesh. And we have the Holy Spirit waiting to help us. We just read it. It's a, it's a weak position. It is weak. It's a weak position to not know what to pray, to not know how to pray. That's a weak position to find yourself in. But the Holy Spirit wants to help us. He wants to pray through us. He wants us to pray in the Spirit. And He actually says there He intercedes. The word intercedes means He stands in the gap for us, between us and God. And He prays with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's talking about tongues. That's talking about tongues. Sometimes there's just no words that come out of your mouth when, when, when you're at a place where you don't know what to do. You don't know how to do it. And just you just let out a groaning. That's your spirit. The Holy Spirit coming forth out of your mouth, praying, interceding on your behalf. Amen. And, and that's why if you've been baptised with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, you should be praying in tongues every day. Every day. Holy Spirit knows what to pray about. And He knows how. He knows the mechanisms. He knows the mysteries. He knows how to, how to touch God's heart. He knows what's really going on. If I pray in the flesh, I'm praying what I see. I'm praying what I desire. I'm praying what's going on around me. I'm praying what I think should happen. And God's saying, I don't receive that prayer. That's you praying in the flesh. When I pray in the Spirit, 
in tongues or with my own language in English or in Spanish, led by the Spirit, I, then I am, I am praying what really needs to be prayed about. And I am praying how the prayer should be prayed. So that's, that's the, uh, the Holy Spirit taking care of things that I don't know. Amen. And it takes control of the situation. Maya, I, I love praying in tongues. I love praying in the Spirit. There's no other prayer that I want to pray. And I catch myself. I do. If I find myself praying in the flesh, I stop quickly. You're praying in the flesh. Stop. Go in the Spirit. Go into the Spirit. Amen. What an amazing help. When you don't know what to do, when you don't know how, pray in the Spirit. Pray in tongues. It's a great help. It strengthens your faith. And it gets the job done. You don't know what goes on up ahead of you. You don't know how doors are being opened in front of you. Amen. And it strengthens you. You could be in front of a a chaotic situation and you don't know what to do, you don't know how to pray, but you pray in tongues, you pray in the Spirit and there's a peace that comes. There's a strengthening of your faith and and God gets the job done. And I've been... you know, I've experienced this many times in my, in my walk with God where I come across a situation that has just surprised me or it's, it's chaotic, it's fearful in the natural and quickly I, I go into praying in the Spirit and it just controls the situation. The natural, the natural hasn't changed. The natural doesn't change, but I change and things begin to change around us. Amen. And, uh, and so you've got to do this intentionally. You've got to do this on purpose every day. Build up your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Amen. I remember when we were going to Sydney, probably I think it was six years ago, and we were going there with my family, and we were traveling in the car to preach there, going to preach there for a whole weekend. And, and most of you know the story that we stopped around, what do we mean, maybe 3.30, 4 in the morning, we stopped at one of those bays to have a little bit of rest, to sleep a little bit. And, and around maybe 5 o'clock in the morning, just when the, the sun is beginning to come out, not nine, actually, it wasn't that, it was still dark. There was a lot of fog. And, and uh, my son Caleb was sleeping behind me, behind my, the driver's seat, and, and I began to hear him make a funny noise. And began to kick my, kick the, the, the chair, the seat, sorry, and, and making a real funny noise with his, with his mouth like he was choking. And I woke up, I got out of the car and, I, and I, we got him out and, and he's having a full on, full blown seizure. His eyes in the back and he's just, he's just, and I, I in that moment I thought, what's, I didn't know what was going on. He's never had a seizure in his whole life. And I thought, is he, is he, going, is he going here? I, said to, I actually said to Eric, well, I think he's going. <laughs> now I think about that. I said, what a dumb thing to say, man, man of faith and power. <laughs> but I still remember that morning, I said, I said to Eric, I, th- I said, I said, Eric, I, th- is he, I think he's going. Remember? <laughs> when I think about, uh, uh, but that just gets you, because he was, and he was slowing down. He was, I'm thinking, <laughs> get, you know, what's going on here? And then he sort of just went into a, into a daze and it got us all by surprise. And more than, we just woke up and you got this, this you know, situation that has completely caught you off guard. You're one of your, your son and who's having a seizure. And I didn't even know it was, a, it was a seizure. I thought he was choking on something. And so... We start praying in our own language and then Sami tries to call the ambulance and there was no reception. It was, it was just a chaotic morning. He managed to con- connect with someone. They asked him, where are you? He says, we're halfway between Brisbane and Sydney. We're in the woods somewhere. And, and Sami, he's got a, he just started to work out the longitude and the altitude and I don't know, all these tudes. I don't know. He started to work it out and he, he worked out where we were, pinpointed where we were and the ambulance, but the ambulance took, I don't know how long. 
and, and, and we still don't know what's going on here. He's like, he's like in a day, he's gone. And I, I said to my wife, I said to her, I don't know what's going on here. And I said, leave, I'm, I leave me for 20 minutes. And I went into the woods. And so I left her with that pickle there. Pobrecita. <laughs> and I went into the woods and just prayed in tongues for 20 minutes. Just, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how to pray, and I don't want to miss it. Something's going on. I thought this is an attack because we're going to Sydney to preach a crusade. It was a big meeting that we were going to preach, and I thought the devil's angry, and I, and I sensed it was a spiritual thing, and I didn't know what to pray, and I didn't know how to pray. But thank God I have the Holy Spirit inside of me, church. Thank God the Holy Spirit is here. And in that, mo in that moment, I can resort to tongues. In that moment, I went into the woods. It, would, it was pitch black. And I don't know, there was a lot of other cars there, people sleeping, and the commotion that we, that we were making. And then me in there, Ramakanda. I got angry. You know, when you pray with tongues, like aggressive. And I just, 20, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And then I came back. And you know what? When I came back, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. No, this is okay. This is, this is done. God is in control. In the midst of that, there was a faith. What happened? Holy Spirit prayed what I don't know. And He prayed in a way that needed to be prayed in that moment. And we got the victory. Although it was a battle, <laughs> what that day was a battle. But we resort to tongues. We resort to tongues. I remember my mother, my mother-in-law, and, and uh, she, my father-in-law called me and my wife once. Come, mother-in-law. My mother-in-law wasn't well. She was, she was not, not understanding the moment. She couldn't recognize the, the her husband. And he called us, and we went to take her to the hospital. And when we got there, the mother-in-law looked like somebody else. Her countenance, and she looked at us, and she didn't know who we were. She was scared. And when I saw that, I, saw, I, I felt, oh, what's going on here? Erica grabbed her on one side. I grabbed her on the other side. And without even talking, we went into tongues. Amen. We went into tongues because we didn't know what was going on and we didn't know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit knew, hallelujah. That's a, that's a weak moment. You're weak there. How do I pray? What do I pray? That's weak. You're limited. You're weak. Yeah. You've got no power what do you pray? How do you pray? Well, the Holy Spirit has been given to us to pray through us in tongues or in your own language led by the Spirit of God to take control of that situation. And when we pray, I remember there was peace. Peace. This has happened over and over and over again. Every day we've got to pray in tongues. We've got to pray in the Spirit. To pray any other way is a limited prayer. Oh, this is a weapon at our disposal, church. Amen. Come on, church. You say, Holy Spirit, can you pray through me about my marriage? Holy Spirit, can you pray through me about my children? Oh, there's been prayers in tongues about my children that the Holy Spirit reveals and the Holy Spirit opens things up and the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom to help them or to direct them. The Holy Spirit knows what to pray, how to pray. To go and recite a prayer. That's flesh. Yeah. Amen. Are we here, church, this morning? Yeah. This is so powerful. It's, you know what it is? It's a weapon of mass destruction. Yeah. The devil does not want you to pray in tongues. The devil does not want you to pray in your own language led by the Spirit. And there's many religious and there's many churches that don't want you to pray in tongues either. Why? Because the devil knows how powerful it is and how destructive it is to his kingdom and how helpful it will be to you and to me as Christians. Never has there been less teaching on this in the church than today. The church today knows the three points to a better marriage. The five points to have a happy family. The ten points to, you know, healing your finances. That's they, all these seeker, superficial, uh, targeted to the flesh teaching that is a non-essential. 
It's like a pastor said, Rob Parsley from America that I like to listen to every now and then. He said, he says, what's this? You need to, you know, go and get the five points to a better marriage. He said, just get into the Holy Ghost. <laughs> just pray in the Holy Ghost. Just allow the, you know, the Holy Spirit is actually called the comforter. In Greek, it's parakletos, one that comes alongside us to help us. He so wants to help us in our prayer life. So you, so you say, Holy Spirit, can you help me pray about this? And then just start praying. Praying in tongues or, or just go to the Bible and, okay, fill me up with the Word of God and then I can pray God's Word. I can pray God's Word. I can pray God's Word in this situation. Amen. Amen. He's the helper. Amen. Say, the Holy Spirit is my helper. We've got an advantage. Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues. Pray in the Spirit. You know, to, to, not, to not pray in the Spirit, to not ask the Holy Spirit to do what He just said in Romans, he, he will help us in our weakness. And I know that He's helped me so much in the ministry. He's helped me and my wife so much in the ministry. We pray in tongues for the church, pray in tongues for the ministry. And, um, and that's why things happen so much in the ministry. Because the Holy Spirit really knows. He, did, he knows people's hearts. He knows people's minds. He knows the finances. He knows. God has always blessed us. God has always prospered us. Never has He let us down. Oh, it's, if I was to tell you how God blesses us, how God prospers us, how God has taken care of this church financially, you would be left with your mouth wide open. And it's not because pastor is an entrepreneur, although I, I, maybe I am a little bit, but not, not uh, you know, like some smart businessman and, and guru in, in finances. It's because I pray in the Holy Ghost. And he's a guru. <laughs> he knows how to bring the finances. He knows how to protect the ministry from wolves in sheep's clothing. Oh, yeah. Amen. To, to, to not pray in tongues is like, have you, ever, have you ever had a problem in your car? You've got a problem in your car and you are not a mechanic, but you try to fix the problem. So you try to, because you're trying to save some, some money. So you try to fix the problem. You, you try to read, you read, you go on YouTube and you find out there's this rattling noise in my engine. What is it, YouTube? What is it, Google? And then you go in and you try to fix it yourself. And you don't know what you're doing. You cause frustration. You cause problems. Now, can you imagine there's a, there's a problem with my car and I'm trying to fix it and standing here is a mechanic. Standing beside me is a mechanic. And I say to the mechanic, no, no, stay out of the way. I'm going to fix this car on my own. I can do it. Leave it to me. And the mechanic just watches you and goes, that rattling noise, I know what it is. Because I can pick up what's the problem just with the, with, with the, the noise, with the vibrations. And you're there trying to, and you're frustrated, and you're trying to make, hours goes by and the mechanic's saying, look, if you just ask me, if you just let me, I'll take care of this in five minutes. Yeah. And that's how many Christians are. We're praying, and we're asking God, and we're trying to pray in our own understanding, in our own flesh. We're trying to work it out in our own abilities. We're trying to maneuver it and trying to make it happen. And the Holy Spirit is here going, can you just let me pray through you? Can you just let me intercede through you? Because I know what to pray and I know how to pray. I know how to work this thing out. Can you say amen, church, this morning? Ah, it's a weak place to be in trying to be a carpenter when you're not a carpenter. It's a weak place to be in trying to cook a meal that you, you, then you don't know how to cook. It's a weak place to be in trying to do anything without knowing how to do it. Yeah. Amen. Can you say amen, church? Praise amen. God. So I want to encourage you this morning. The, the Apostle Paul says, he says, I will pray in tongues. I will. That's will. I will purposely, I will pray in the Spirit. Over and over again, he says, forbid no one to speak in tongues. 
forbid no one to speak in tongues. He says it there over and over again. I wish that you all spoke with tongues, he says. Amen. And then when he talks about uh, the gift, see, people, people don't understand the difference between the gift of tongues and just tongues as a prayer language that you receive when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Two different things. Two different things. So we need to understand the two different things. Amen. So when you're praying in tongues, you're not giving a, a, a prophetic word. If I was, if, if I was, the Apostle Paul says, if I was to come up here now and I, and if I started praying, not praying, but I started giving a, a, a prophetic word in tongues, it's of no value to you unless someone comes and interprets. But that's what he's talking about. He's saying, when, if I was to preach in tongues, what value will you get out of it unless someone interprets, then you get benefit. But that's the gift. That's the gift. But if we all start praying in tongues here, if we all start praying in tongues, that's not the gift of tongues as in you're not giving a prophetic word. You're praying in tongues. The same way that if we all speak in English, that doesn't mean you're giving a prophecy. How do I know you're giving a prophecy? Because he says, a prophecy is used for exhortation, for edification, amen, for the church. But how do I know you're giving a prophetic word if we're all talking in English at the same time? How do I know? How do I know if we're all worshipping in tongues, if we're all praying in tongues, how do I know now you're, giving a, uh, uh, you're, you're functioning in the gift of tongues, giving a message to the church? How do I know? Well, it's the same way I know in English if you're giving a prophetic word. How do I know? Your voice goes really loud. Thus said the Lord, really loud, and everyone stays quiet. Then that word is a prophetic word for the church. It's the same way in tongues. If we're all worshipping tongues, if we're all praying in tongues, but someone goes really loud, really loud, everyone stays quiet. And then someone must interpret that so that the church can be edified. The Apostle Paul only uses a passage, a part of that chapter, to talk about the gift. The rest of it, he's talking about your prayer. We just read it, we read it the first verse. For I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. Okay, let's go now to... I've got a few, few more minutes here. Let's go now to part two of this. Now, we're all clear that we need, to, we need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray in tongues. We need to pray in our own language, but led by the Spirit. Okay? Now, there is singing in the Spirit. Singing in the Spirit is, is something that we need to do, which is, again, we sing in tongues and we sing in our own language, but led by the Spirit. Spirit. Can you say amen, church? Yes. And this is what we need today in the church because there's too much singing in the flesh. Yes. There's too much flesh singing in the church. Yes. That's not spirit. Yes. We've lost the dimension of spirit worship in the church. Yes. We've lost the art of worshiping in tongues in the church. And I want our church to have, I, want, I, I don't want any. Uh, I don't want any doubt that we are a Pentecostal, Spirit-filled, baptism with the Holy Spirit, tongue-talking church. We're not ashamed of it. We're not afraid of it. It's a blessing for us as a church, and we want to function in it because that's what God wants us to do. Amen. And so... There is, there is something powerful about singing in the Spirit. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Look what it says. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Apostle Paul said, I will sing in the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. 
He's making a difference between praying and singing in your own language and singing in tongues. And he's saying, I will, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with my understanding. But when you sing with your understanding, it has to be led by the Spirit. Amen? So worship is a powerful weapon. Worship is a powerful weapon. Listen to this, when it's done right. So if you think about these, all these things that we're talking about, preaching, prayer, worship, living, all these elements of church life have been neglected. Have been neglected. And what we think is worship today might not be worship in God's eyes. Worship for God to accept it, just like prayer, has to be done in spirit and in truth. And worship, just like prayer, spirit prayer is powerful. Spirit preaching is powerful. Preaching that is done in the spirit is powerful. Powerful. Just as living in the spirit is powerful, worship, when it's done right, is so powerful. When it's done in the spirit. You know, I've gone into churches, I've preached in so many churches in so many nations. And I can pick up, you know, where the Spirit is heavy and where the Spirit is very light. And it starts with the worship. It starts with the worship. You know, I've gone into churches where the whole church is worshipping in tongues. And you can just sense the atmosphere is different. It's just different. There's something about that place. Because worshipping in the Spirit is an access to the glory of God. It, it helps us to tap into heaven. It creates an open heaven over us. Worship in the Spirit is one of the quickest ways to get into God's presence. So why would we worship any other way? Worshiping in the Spirit. Worship is heaven's aroma. Singing in the Spirit opens heaven. And it helps us to stay connected to an open heaven. It, is, it brings down the atmosphere of the glory of God. Remember the, the, the word of the Lord says, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory. So we want to go into in the glory. We want to be in the glory. And one of the quickest ways to get in the glory is worshipping in spirit. Actually, the Bible says the Father is seeking such worshippers. <laughs> you know, I, I forget what, what book it is in, in the Old Testament where God says to the people of Israel, I've had enough of your songs. <laughs> I've had enough of your music. I've had enough of your loud, loud exuberance every time you gather. Why does he say that? Because you do it to satisfy yourselves. You do it as a religious activity, as a religious act. You know, the three songs and the three, the three fast songs and the two slow ones, <laughs> that's a problem. He seeks spirit worship. I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but this is all the way through the Bible. Ephesians 5, 18, 19. Be not drunk with wine. Come on, brother, sister, don't be drunk with wine. Which is excess. What does that mean? Excess. Which will cause you to lose control. But be filled with the Spirit. How? Listen to this. Please listen to this. Speaking to yourselves with psalms, and hymns, now listen to this, spiritual songs. Hallelujah. Spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Hallelujah. Wow. He, the Apostle Paul says, when you come together, how are you going to be filled with the Spirit of God? Well, you, you bless each other with hymns and with, with uh, psalms and with spiritual songs. What's that? Worshipping in tongues. 
worshipping in the Spirit. How? Singing and making melody in your heart. Hallelujah. You just sense straight away the atmosphere changes when we sing in the Spirit. God, God comes on the scene where there is spirit worship. He seeks such that would worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know, we, we think that wherever, wherever they sing praise and worship, God is there. Not really. Not really. We think wherever a preacher preaches the Word of God, God is there. Not really. We, have a, we think that wherever there's a gathering of people praying, God is there. Not really, because the, the, you know, the, the Muslims pray. The Hare Krishnas pray. Is God there? Come on, church. Worship is about getting, creating an atmosphere. Not for us to show off our music. Not for you to show how good and beautiful your voice is. Not for the platform to be filled with so many musicians and so many singers. And, and for the church just to look at it as a, as a participation, no, not a participation, as a, as a concert or as a, you know, we're, we're an item. I can't, I, you know, something that I can't really swallow is when churches do items. We're going to do an item. We're, we're in the sense of, I understand doing an item and get up and sing with me, but an item as in, you sit there and, and, and watch me worship God. I just can't see the Apostle Paul saying, we've got sister so-and-so that has an item today and she's going to sing. Unless they use that and all of a sudden everyone just begins to worship along with that. We've, we've gone, we've got to bring this thing back. We've got to, the simplicity of spirit worship. I don't think it would be a bad thing if all the electricity went off on a Sunday morning and there was no instruments and there was no microphones because then we would be pushed to worship in spirit and in truth. Amen. Not in flesh, but in spirit and in truth. Come on, church. This is so, are you getting, this is powerful. I know, I know this is so foreign to the, to what's going on in the church today. If we just had one guitar, maybe we just need one, just one guitar. Come on, come on church, worship the Lord. Come on, start worshiping the Lord. Lift up your voice. Start going in the Spirit. Start singing in the Spirit. Look at the simplicity of the book of Acts church. Look at the simplicity of the church in the, in the time of Paul. When you come together, just speak to yourselves with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. How? In psalms and hymns. Here we go again. Spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, we've got it more than one time. Spiritual songs. The Apostle Paul said, I will sing in the Spirit first. Then second, I will sing with my natural language led by the Spirit. But when was the last time that the majority of the praise and worship was in the Spirit? Wow. But you know that there are churches around the world that they start and they just start flowing in the Spirit? They don't even have... uh, order of, you know, song list. Just start playing, start playing, start playing, start playing, start worshipping. Do you know that song, if I'm not wrong, somebody somebody will tell me later on if I'm wrong, but you know the song, this is how I fight my battles. That was birthed in just a moment where everyone was just playing and singing. It wasn't written beforehand. It wasn't, it wasn't done in a studio. They didn't come around like today. Everyone comes around. We're going to write a song. Let's all come around. We're going to write a song. What do you think? What word do you, what word do you think will fit right here? They were just playing and all of a sudden someone's, is that right, Sammy? Yeah. They started, someone started singing, this is how I fight my battle. Can you imagine the anointing in that place? 
when they went into the throne of God with that song. Spirit songs. Singing in the Spirit. Now, for us to sing in the Spirit, look at the first part of Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly. So we just sang a song that Sammy wrote before. The song that we just sang before about the cross, about Jesus. That, for me, now you're saying you're his dad, but for me, that is a spirit-filled song because it is full of the Word. If you listen to the average praise and worship song today, if you were to put it on, on, on a normal radio station and no one told you that it was, it, was, it was praise and worship, you would think it was a song just written, a romantic song to someone. Or you would, it would be a song about life. Or then you have songs that have nothing to do with the Word. There are some songs we sing in the church that are not spirit. I remember back in the days in, the, in, the, in our Spanish churches, some songs there that you go, that's not biblical. And we sing it. I don't want, I, I was about to sing one, but I, <laughs> I won't sing it because maybe you like it. But there's so many songs that are not spirit filled, they're not spirit led. They're nice, they, they tantalize the flesh, the senses. We go, wow, that's a beautiful song. Is it biblical? Yeah. Is it biblical? See, so first, if we want to sing in the Spirit, we need to, I love that. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Everybody say richly. richly. Well, richly means full. Yeah. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you full. So then you can sing songs in the Spirit. It'll flow out of you. It'll be easy to sing in the Spirit when you're full of the Word. It's easy to pray in the Spirit when you're full of the Word. It's easy to preach in the Spirit when you're full of the Word. It's easy to live your life in the Spirit when you're full of the Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Get into the Word. Fill yourself up with the Word. And you watch how your worship goes to another level. You won't, you won't have to come late to church because you don't want to worship God because you don't know what to, how to sing. You don't know, I don't know how to sing. I don't know what to sing. I feel embarrassed. You won't, you, you, won't, you won't avoid worship. You won't avoid the prayer meeting. Amen. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then you worship. You worship. Hallelujah. I feel like worshiping right now. Praise God. Just worship inside. And you watch how your worship goes to another level. It goes to another level. Can you say amen, church, this morning? We have made, I'm just going to make some statements and, and then we'll, uh, we'll close and we'll, we're going to worship a little bit. We have made praying and singing in tongues a non-essential in the church of today. And we have therefore rendered the church void of power. And what we have been left with is worship that is fleshy and led by the senses and that is not, not the spirit and lacks anointing and power. Lacks anointing and lacks power. Oh, hallelujah. Worship has become entertainment. Listen to this. Worship has become entertainment instead of ministering to God. So it's all of, worship has become about entertain me. Minister to me. Instead of worship is about ministering to God. It's about loving Him. It's about giving to Him. It's about saying, I create an atmosphere that you're welcome in. You're welcome in this atmosphere. You're welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. One of the quickest ways to welcome the Holy Spirit into a place, into your bedroom, into your prayer closet, into the church is worship in spirit, in spirit and in truth. It's not entertainment. The musicians are not here to show off. We want God to show off. Can you stay mentors? We want God to show off. You know what music is? Music. 
And it, again, music also has been so misplaced in the church of today. And it's been become such a priority. It's become such a, uh, the main thing. When it should be, music is the underlying thing. Music is the vehicle for our, for our singing. It just helps us. If music doesn't help us to worship, well, then it's not effectively doing its, the work that it should be doing. Amen. So, for example, David, King Saul is depressed. King Saul wants to kill himself. And so they bring David to play the harp. And the Bible says, as soon as he played the harp, and I'm sure he would sing, the Bible says the spirit that was depressing Saul would depart from him just through worship. Worship. I'm waiting for the day that as we worship, people are being healed. People are being set free. People are being delivered as we worship because our worship is spirit led by the spirit. Hallelujah. This is very important, church. We can make or break a service with good, right worship or wrong worship. If we don't worship right, we might have a good service, but we're not going to have a God service. We might have a good time, but we're not going to have a God time. Worship has become all about how it makes me feel instead of establishing an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit feels welcome to move. The Apostle Paul said, I will sing in the Spirit and I will sing with my understanding. The question must be asked this morning, are we singing in the Spirit? Are we singing in the Spirit? Or do we come to church and we're just so distracted and we're so preoccupied, we're not in the Spirit, we're missing out. We're missing out. See, church was never meant to be just a gathering to fill up time. Church was always meant to be what the Apostle Paul said, have a hymn, have a psalm, have a spiritual song. Why? So His presence comes. If we walk away from this place today just saying, wow, that was a good service, we've missed it. But if we walk away saying, wow, I sensed His presence. He ministered to me. I was touched. I was healed. I was encouraged. Well, then that's all worth it. Amen. There are many people that don't want to go to a Spirit-filled church. They want to go to a church that's that's they can hide in there. And they can just get involved with the programmings and the social life of that church. I don't want to... I've got enough of a, so we've got enough of a social life. When I come to church, I want to connect with the Spirit of God. I want to know Him more than what I know Him now. I want to, I want to add value to this congregation. Your worship, your worship with His worship, with her worship, with His worship, with their worship, over there with your worship, coming together starts to establish an atmosphere. Oh, church, if we can get this, you watch what will happen here. We will start seeing creative miracles in the glory, in the glory. We will start seeing salvation. People will start getting saved in the worship time because they will sense His presence. Depression will go in the worship. Hallelujah. Let's sing in the Spirit, church. Let's sing in the Spirit. Sing in other tongues. Sing in tongues. Sing in your own language, led by the Spirit. You're full of the Word. The Word of God is in you richly. Begin to sing to God another song. Begin to sing to God a new song. And you watch what comes over you. If you feel depressed this morning, start worshipping in the Spirit. If you have a physical sickness, start worshipping in the Spirit. You watch what happens. If you're confused this morning, Start worshipping in the Spirit. If you're afraid of tomorrow, start worshipping in the Spirit. Say, but pastor, how do I do that? Just say, God, sing through me. Worship through me. 
receive my words today. I want to encourage the church to sing in the Spirit, to pray in the Spirit. May God help us today. Amen. Let's all stand up this morning. Hallelujah.